Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to have you here this weekend, and um, I'm excited about the opportunity I have to con continue our series on the giving life, and uh, Jason began the first of this month talking about the importance of using our time for kingdom purposes, and John already mentioned his message last week about the tithe challenge and, and uh, putting God first uh, in our giving. Well, this week I have the privilege of talking about talents, the third part of our giving life, and um, as I was thinking about our time together, if you'll recall about three weeks ago, or maybe four weeks ago, I talked about spiritual gifts. And uh, as I put these two messages together, just want to remind you that God gives us spiritual gifts and talents for a purpose. And that purpose is that we might be servants, that we might serve others. And in fact, as Christ followers, do you realize it's a biblical mandate? These are the words of Peter. As each one of you, that means that God has gifted all of us as we have received a special gift, use it in serving one another as good stewards. And so part of the stewardship process is recognizing that God gives us gifts and talents, but that we're using them for a purpose. Again, not to build our ego, but to serve and make a difference in the lives of other people. And as I was thinking about the importance of purpose and understanding why God has given us gifts, uh, I was thinking of several years ago, I was watching a talk show. And uh, they had a bunch of these bodybuilders lined up on the platform, and they were going through their routine, you know, doing these kinds of things and, and all that kind of stuff. Are you guys impressed with my muscles today, you know? And, and uh, obviously that I have never, getting exercise, listing the, the fork to my mouth. But at any rate, so they're doing all of this, you know, and doing all of these things. And so right in the middle, the talk show host asked them all a question. They say, wow, you've got muscles on your muscles. What do you use them for? And they were going. <laughs> and he goes, no, you obviously don't understand. Why do you use those muscles? <laughs> and, and, and so that obviously the talk show host was kind of surprised. Well, you, you have all these muscles, but you're not using them. Well, by the way, uh, they looked a little bit like this. Do you guys recognize this guy? Our former governor, Arnold, he was Mr. Olympia, but I, I loved what followed. Have you ever seen this bumper sticker? My governor can beat up your governor. <laughs> but the reason that God gave us gifts and talents is for a reason, that we would use them in service for his kingdom's sake. Well, I want to look at a passage of scripture today that gives us some clarity about this whole idea of why God gives us and it's the, the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 22. So if you have your Bible or your mobile device, I want to encourage you to turn to Luke chapter 22. There are three or four verses that I want us to read together. And we're going to start at verse 24. And uh, before we begin, I want to give a little quick backstory to this. The, these words are, uh, come from the, the, the upper room just hours before Jesus goes to the cross. And so he's there with his disciples. And um, this is what happens. A dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. And Jesus, understanding this, said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But that is not to be, you're not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you shall be like the youngest, and the one who rules like one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. And that'll serve as the basis for our message today. And as we begin, uh, I, I mentioned this maybe, in fact, uh, a year ago or so. I grew up in Colorado, and the, one of the joys of my young life was every summer, my brother and I would go to my uncle's farm in eastern Colorado. And uh, it was so much fun. We got to drive tractors and, and Jeeps and ride horses and even to help take care of the animals. They had calves that they would go to the fair. And so we'd groom these calves, these big steers. It was so much fun. And that one of the other things that they had is chickens. So we got to feed the chickens and pick up the eggs. You know, if you're a, a city boy, even stuff like that is really fun. But one of the things that I discovered, how many of you have ever heard the idea of a pecking order? The idea of pecking order. Do you know where that, that came from? It actually came from the barnyard. And uh, that if you, for example, I read this and one day I must have had some t time on my hands or something, but I, I actually read that if you put like 10 hens in a yard within a short period of time through a series of little skirmishes that they will determine a pecking order. And so they begin to fight and peck each other before too long. You have hen numero uno. 
And so hen numero uno will peck number, hen number two, but hen number two will not peck hen number one. Then hen number two will peck hen number three, but will not peck hen number two. Then hen number four will be pecked by hen number three, but will not peck hen number, and so you get the point. But if you are at the bottom of that, it's a pretty miserable life. Imagine being pecked, but having no one to peck. But uh, you know, I wish that I could tell you that pecking order only occurs in the barnyard, but it happens every day in corporate America, and uh, even at family picnics, and uh, one of the other things, and how many of you have ever been to a high school reunion? It's really, well, what do you do? And so there, it's, we establish pecking order. It, it happens everywhere. Now, I'm going to be a little transparent. I, um, not long ago, I was uh, with a group of pastors, and I, I wish that it, we were above that. But before too long, the question always comes up, well, uh, how large is your church that you're pastoring? And so even with pastors that we're establishing this whole idea of pecking order. But we have a tendency as human beings to view others in terms of their profession as well as their position in the community and that we subconsciously or maybe even consciously establish a pecking order. And, um, you know, it's natural, but it's also not exclusive as far as a malady of modern man. Um, it even happened in the hours just before Jesus went to the cross in the upper room. And uh, so as we look at this story, I need to let you know that as you read this gospel account in Luke 22, do you recognize that it was not the first time that this had happened? Actually, this was the third time something similar had happened. And the disciples had had this conversation at two other occasions that those who were closest to the Savior were having this lively discussion about which one of them would have been greatest. And that every time this discussion came up, Jesus was grieved and gently rebuked them and reminded them about the most important calling as his followers, and that was to be servants and to serve. And, you know, uh, I was thinking about our time together, that as pastors here at Calvary Temple, we could instruct you in all kinds of things about uh, how to, to, to pray and how to uh, grow in your spiritual life. Those are all important and, and, and very, very significant. But if we have not taught you all about the significance and helped you in being involved in service, we've missed a big part of the gospel. Because as we think about Jesus, what did he come to do? Very clearly, he said that I did not come to what? Serve. Or did not come to be served, but to serve. And that, would you hear this? And you might uh, want to write this down. This is so important, friends. Here it is. That we will never be more like Jesus than when we serve. We will never be more like Jesus than when we serve, because that was the epitome of his life. And uh, so I want to look at the passage of Scripture today, and I want you to notice there are three challenges that uh, are, are right in this passage of Scripture about this whole idea of being servants. And it begins with this. Here it is, that we have to deal with our basic bent, and that is we want to be served. Would you say amen or ouch right there? That's that what, is what we need. Um, Notice the text begins with these words, and again, understand the, the context, that Jesus and his followers are in the upper room, and they're preparing for the final Passover. The disciples are trying to develop the pecking order, and uh, see, where you sat at the table would determine what you did at the meal. For example, if you, became, if you were at the end of the table, guess what? You got to wash everybody else's feet. And so it says, a dispute arose among them, about who would be greatest, and they were giving their claim to fame. No, I should be closest to Jesus because of this. And, uh, you know, in my sanctified imagination, I can imagine some of the conversations that were going on around the table. For example, Peter, James, and John says, don't you guys remember? We were the ones that were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. They go, well, that's right. But then Levi said, well, that's pretty impressive, but don't you remember that I was one of the first ones that Jesus called? They go, oh, that's right. <laughs> And then Nathaniel. By the way, did you hear about the pastor who got a, a badge for humility, but they took it away when he wore it? Uh, so <laughs> and so here is humble Nathaniel saying, well, guys, it was me, if you will recall, that Jesus said is a man without guile. And so this is going on around the table in the moments before Jesus goes to the cross. 
And again, he obviously is grieved by all of the things that he heard. And it says, the, the word dispute, by the way, is in the present continuous tense, meaning this is not the first time it happened, nor would it be the last. It speaks to the fact that this was uh, an ongoing conversation that they had had about who would be greatest. Now, picking up the story in John chapter 13, again, Jesus hears this, and he goes, man, alive, these guys just do not get it. And so he engages in what I call the ultimate visual aid. He gets up, takes off his outer garment, picks up a bowl with a basin of water, and wraps a towel around himself, and he goes one by one and begins to wash their feet. Do you remember uh, Southwest Airlines about awkward moments? This was the ultimate awkward moment. Can you imagine the disciples? It was just deathly quiet in the room. And that Jesus is going by one by one and washing their feet. It was such an embarrassing moment when they recognized that Jesus, and it was Peter who said, to whom shall we go for you alone have the words of life. So they recognized him as Lord and Savior and as the Messiah. But it was in those moments that Jesus once and for all redefined what greatness is all about. He redefined greatness. You see, the disciples should have been serving him, but instead, he made a powerful point. And to make sure that they got it, he said to them, do you understand what I've done for you? You know, they were a little dense, weren't they? This wasn't the first time. Do you guys understand now what I've done? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, as your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. And that he clearly demonstrated that greatness has nothing to do with position or title or stature. Friends, it's not about position, but it's everything about possession. Do you have a heart to serve? That's what he was asking them. Do you have a heart to serve? And that the truly great among you would be willing to simply engage in acts of service. It's not looking for publicity, acclaim, title, or, or even the acclaim of others. I was thinking about this during World War II. England needed to increase its coal production to help with the war effort. And so Winston Churchill, the prime minister of England, called together the labor leaders to enlist their support. And then, at the end of his presentation... He asked them to picture in their minds, after the war had been won, a parade that would go through Piccadilly Circus, and he said, first of all would come the soldiers that had been withdrawn from Dunkirk, and then had gone on to defeat Rommel in North Africa, and then would be the pilots that had driven the Luftwaffe, Luftwaffe from the skies. And then last, he said, imagine with me, would come 10,000 men with set sweat-stained, soot-streaked faces in miners' caps, and that someone would call from the crowd, and where were you during the critical days of our struggle? And from the voices of these 10,000 men would come their reply, we were deep in the earth with our faces to the coal. Man, that makes me want to sign up right there, <laughs> that we were deep in the earth with our faces to the coal. You see, church, not all the jobs in kingdom are prominent or glorious. And in fact, right now, aren't you glad we have people in the nursery that are taking care of those? You know, by the way, did you hear the church that has a sign over the nursery? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And uh, so, <laughs> so anyway, we've got people in there that are doing that. They shall all be changed because they have a heart to serve, even in the not so glamorous jobs. But well, then let me also simplify it even a bit more, that our calling is to follow Christ's example. In John 13, 15, Jesus said to the 12, and, and to us today, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. That in that moment, I want you to know that Jesus set the bar so low that anyone could reach it. That you don't have to have a PhD from standard for any special desire a duty, abilities, just desire. And could I suggest this to you this morning, friends? That if you're not engaged in serving somewhere, I question your allegiance to Jesus. Because that really was the epitome 
of his life. There must be a family resemblance because Jesus served, we too must serve. But you know, I'm just an extremely practical man and that uh, when you make a statement like that, I know that immediately we come up with excuses, don't we? Well, Steve, you just don't understand all the things that are on my plate right now. And uh, I love Rick Warren in his book, The Purpose Driven Life. Um, he, he asked this question. He said, what excuse have you been using? Abraham was old. Jacob was insecure. Leah was unattractive. Joseph was abused. Moses stuttered. Gideon was poor. Samson was codependent. Rahab was immoral. David had an affair and all kinds of family problems. Elijah was suicidal. Jeremiah was depressed. Jonah was reluctant, Naomi, uh, Naomi was a widow, John the Baptist was eccentric to say the least, Peter was impulsive and hot-tempered, Martha worried a lot, the Samaritan woman had several failed marriages, Zacchaeus was unpopular, uh, Thomas had doubts, Paul had poor health, Timothy was timid, so what's your excuse? <laughs> the fact that we're all busy, aren't we? We all have things on our plates, but we have to get past the excuses because when we serve others in the name of Jesus, it's a powerful witness to an unbelieving world. And that is a language that everyone understands. But there's something else too. Jesus said it's the key to God's blessing. How many of you want to be blessed? How many of you want God's blessing the rest of your life? Well, here he said it right here. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you talk about them. You'll be blessed if you share this with other people. No, it says you'll be blessed what? If you do this. If you're engaged, and so that's the challenge, that God's blessing flows to those who have a servant's heart. So the first thing we have to do is we have to get our heart right. Well, the second thing I see in this passage is that we have to embrace the revelation of a new order, that we have to embrace the revelation of a new order. The words again of Jesus that highlights how our world operates, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, but not so with you. And so he gave a contrast and that it's really true in our culture that people do whatever they can to climb the ladder, to grab for the juggler so they can move up the ladder. And so what we do is we seek to get to the position and to the place where we're no longer serving, but people are serving us, that we order people around. And now don't misunderstand, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with being the president or the owner of your company or in a position of authority, but you know, I believe that God has positioned you there for a purpose, and that is that you might serve him and honor him right there so that people can see the difference that Jesus has made in you, and that there God can use you, and that God gives influence not to build our ego or enable us to lord it over others but to serve others and bring glory to him. I love the story I heard years ago about George Washington that he was riding out in the countryside and that uh, he noticed this guy that was repairing this uh, uh, stone wall. And so he dismounted and he began to help the man fix this uh, breach in this rock wall. And the man looked over and he recognized him as General George Washington. And he was stunned. And he said, General Washington, you're, you're too big a man to do this. And George looked at him and said, no, I think I'm about the right size. And uh, I love that attitude, not being too big for your britches, but willing to serve where you're needed. Because those in God's kingdom choose to live by a different set of rules. Again, people in our culture are looking to move up the ladder, and not for opportunities to serve, but to be served. And looking for perks and privileges. But Jesus warns us, friends, to not get caught up in that. And even the words of Paul, remember in Philippians, that says that have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus, that he became a servant. He gave up his position. And so church being a follower of Jesus means that we do things differently, that we do not use and abuse power, and that we don't use our position to lord it over others. As I was... Um, preparing this message, I uh, have a picture in my office. I actually have a little Broncos shrine. Go Broncos. You know, let's pray for the Broncos. They need help this year, you know, so <laughs> they need divine intervention. But uh, at any rate, um, there's a picture of Tim Tebow, you know, Tebowing where he's praying, kneeling down and praying. But I was thinking about him and I heard something this past week that really, uh, really impressed me. That did you know, because Tim Tebow, uh, lots of people know him, Heisman Trophy winner, had been in the NFL and all kinds of stuff. 
but that he has used his position to make an incredible difference. And he started the Tim Tebow Foundation. And this is the vision statement. It exists to bring faith, hope, and love to those needing a brighter day in their darkest hour of need. And do you know what the purpose is? Is to help children that have special needs. And to date, they've helped almost 100,000. One of them is a night to shine that they have proms for special needs kids and that they have a hospital in the Philippines. They have the One Wish uh, Foundation as well as orphan care. And so that he has used his position not to promote himself, but to make the difference in the lives of more than 100,000 of these special needs kids. Isn't that great? May his number increase. Praise God. He's a dynamic Christ follower and he's making a difference. Just before her death as well, I remember the words of Mother Teresa and what a powerful statement that she simply said that I want to be God's pencil writing a love letter to the world. I want to be God's pencil. Isn't that a great, great statement? And so that you see that, that we, have, we need to have a revelation of a new order. Well, then the last thing I see in this passage, it says that we must aspire to a new standard of greatness so that we are going to deal with our bent, that we are going to have a new revelation and understanding, but also aspire to a new standard of greatness. And that Jesus said it powerfully and yet very simply, he who would be greatest must be servant of all. Simple. In my humble opinion, you know, friends, our world has a really messed up idea about what greatness is. Think with me this morning. Who would be some people that we would be considered great in our culture? You know, it might be uh, Tim Cook, the CEO of, of Apple, or it could be uh, Adele, this great singer, or maybe Bill Gates, the richest man in the world, or Emma Stone, the highest paid actress in the world, or it could be maybe the, the latest winner of American Idol, or it could be the, the season's survivor, but that we idolize superstars and, and you know, singers and the Hollywood elite who make millions of dollars simply to entertain us, and that they are the idols of millions today. But notice what that says about greatness. Think about it. You're great because of how much money you make, or because of your ability, or because of your look, something that, in a sense, that you were born with. Friends, think with me. In that system, the number of people who can be great is extremely limited, because very few of us are rich. We're not all loaded with oodles and gobs of talent and ability, and not very many of us this morning, as I look around, would make People's Magazine the, the 50, 50 hottest men and women in America, although my wife thinks I make the list, but, uh, you know, <laughs> at any rate. But, uh, yes, amen, amen. <laughs> at least there's one person. But, uh, but would you hear me today, friends? In God's economy, we can all be great. Because why? Because we can all serve. Turn to somebody right now and say, you have greatness written all over you. Amen. That we can all be great, Renee, because we can all serve. There's opportunities in our neighborhoods and here at church and, and the, all throughout the East Bay. I think some of you that, that uh, Catherine's here on the front row serve so faithfully year after year after year in our prayer ministry. And she was downstairs praying when nobody else saw that. And I see Buster and Donna, they do so many things around here. And, and there are so many, Jim and Kat uh, Levitt and Victor Garcia and Myra Gonzalez and Sonny Tanberg. There are so many of you. God bless you. I salute you today because you're serving faithfully. And that I, I believe that God is going to have a star on your crown that says the word great. Because you see, you're serving. And that's how God measures greatness. It's not about how much you have, but it's how much you give. It's not about what you have, but what you give. God's not impressed with your titles or whatever, but he wants to know if you have a heart to serve. So if you want to be great in God's eyes, grab a towel Get a mop bucket, put on an apron, pick up a hammer, go across the street and lend a hand. Do something for someone else without any thought of getting something in return. Because you see, truly great people are not superstars, they're servants. Amen? Those are the great people in our culture, are people who serve, who choose to do that. I love the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He said, everyone can be great because anybody can serve. 
You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. I want to challenge you with this today, church, that God has great expectations for every one of us. And it doesn't matter if you are oozing with talent or you kind of get confused chewing bubblegum and trying to walk at the same time, that God has given you ability, he's given you talents and gifts, and that he wants you to use them. No, no, no. He's expecting you to use what he has given you for his glory. And that there is going to be a life audit for every one of us on that day when we stand before Jesus. And that he's going to ask us, what did you do with what I entrusted into your care? Remember, it says we must be stewards of the manifold gifts of God. So don't hide what you've been given. Do something for his kingdom's sake. And that my dream and God's desire is that every one of us who call this their church home would be engaged in service somewhere. Well, before I wrap this up today, I need to ask a very practical question because I want to make this simple. And so that here again, we don't miss the point. The question is, what does foot washing look like today? Are we, but before you go today, go out into the lobby and we have a basin for everyone with a towel and a, you know, if you're doing that at Bar Station, they, people are going to think you're weird. In fact, I would think you're weird. And uh, so what does it look like today? There are so many opportunities in so many ways that we can wash feet. And it begins with this, simply finding a need. You know, some of you are involved in Hope to Home. You have an opportunity at Christmas. It's called Christmas to the Community, where you can help a family or an individual that will have no Christmas without you. Options for women making a, li- a, a, a difference in the lives of women that are considering maybe an abortion. Uh, some months ago, I went to the police department and see if they had needs. I checked under volunteer. There were dozens of opportunities and ways that you could volunteer at the police department. At Big Brothers and Big Sisters, Royal Family Kids Camp, they need counselors this coming summer to make a difference in the life of a child. Um, there is also Family Justice Center. Adopt a school. We've adopted three or four schools in our community, and we're making a difference in the lives of kids. A relief efforts, Convoy of Hope. We need a couple of thousand volunteers this next spring in Convoy of Hope. Our children's ministry, youth ministry, Everywhere we need people that will simply say that uh, that's something that I can do and that you can step up and you can make a difference. And so my challenge to all of us is that I want to encourage you, the the world is filled with words, but we must choose to demonstrate God's love by being willing to do something. And you fill in the blank, It's, it's... whatever God's calling you to do, how he's specially gifted you. Well, as I conclude, there is a legend about St. Francis of Assisi and that the early days of his life, he was very wealthy, nothing but the best for him, but he was ill at ease and he had no peace of mind. And one day he was riding alone outside the city where he lived and he saw a leper, a mass of sores, and boils, and ordinarily Francis would have been recoiled at such a horrible sight, but something moved inside of him, and he dismounted, and again, as the legend is told, he flung his arms around this man, this leper, and as he embraced him, the leper turned into the figure of Jesus. I'm reminded of the words of the master who said, for as much as you have done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. And so when you choose to, whether it's serve in the nursery or pray, have your face to the coal, When you're doing it unto the least, you're actually serving Jesus. And that he left an example that we should follow in his steps. And so that I believe that the call of the Spirit to the church today, to you and to me, is that we would choose to serve somewhere 
and in the process make a powerful statement to an unbelieving world that Jesus is alive, that he is real, and that he's using you to make a difference. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together this morning.